We're going to look at a period of French history um, between 1945, so just as Europe emerged from World War II, right through into relatively recent times. This is, each year this gets further and further away, but right up to 1975. It was a period of huge continuity and change, and it's perfect for doing essays on and for studying, because it's, although it's not real history yet, although Second World War is taught as history in schools now at, at, um, at school level, although 1975 may not be real history yet, it's not, not old enough quite, it has been long enough for this period to have been written about by uh, researchers in academic journals and in textbooks. And really to do a third year uh, undergraduate honours level essay, you really need access to journal material. And if we tried to tackle a period that was more recent, say 2020 or 2019, is insufficient material in textbooks and in journal articles for you to do a, a full uh, academic and critical approach to the essay. And, and I'll come back to this as a gentle warning as we, as we start to talk about essay topics for you to pick. It's something to beware of if you're trying to work at this level within one semester or a term and a bit and to try and do a substantial piece of work that's that's valid and of really good quality. You need to pick an, a, a time period that's a little bit longer ago because there isn't really time to do honours dissertation level research that you're doing for your, for your big project uh, for, your, for the end of your main subject, say in tourism and hospitality or business studies or English. So that's why I'm picking this period because it's well documented and well criticised and analysed. There's lots more lecture and reference material online. I won't stay on this very long, but I'll come back to it when we have a break at the end of the formal lecture. Um, and I use this little cartoon drawing of a French peasant, mainly a man, mainly a male French peasant, um, trying to tear his roots up from the soil out in the French countryside in some muddy field in Picardy or down near, um, down in the southwest of France and make his way towards the city, La Ville, the town. And that symbolises what this period was about. Although I've just finished reading a really excellent novel by um, Claire Eccirelli about a young woman who travels up from uh, Bordeaux to go and work in Paris. Fantastic novel, really good, in this same period in the 60s. In French studies, this period has been named as Les Trente Glorieuses, the 30 glorious ones, the 30 glorious years. In France, it was given this name, um, this period was given this name because it was a period of growth, financial growth, prosperity, where people were having better lives, not living in such uh, squalor, such squalid conditions. But it also was a time of abrupt social change where people were finally feeling liberated from the authoritarian forces that were controlling their lives. And we call them les trente glorieuses, the 30 glorious years. The time between the liberation of France from um, uh, Nazi uh, colonization by the, uh, the German army in 1944 and an economic downturn which was triggered by what, what in the Western countries the oil users would call the oil crisis and that was a time when the countries that produced and exported oil finally realised that they ought to be charging a lot more for oil. So we call it a crisis in the West but if you're in Iran or Iraq it was a time of taking your fair share of oil prices. So it's uh, viewed from different angles, it's a different term um, whether it was a crisis or a time of great prosperity in 1973. And I use this photograph that I took in Paris. I don't know if anyone, anyone can imagine where I was standing when I took the photograph. Only very few very tall buildings in Paris and I was upon the viewing deck of the tour Montparnasse above the railway station in Montparnasse. There's a one sole skyscraper in Paris and you look you can look um, 
absolutely due west to see the Eiffel Tower. And it's quite a shock how big the Eiffel Tower is in proportion to the rest of the city. And then if you let your eye go further west still, you see a little cluster or quite a big cluster of, of new skyscrapers built during the 60s and 70s and peaking in the 70s and 80s. And that area is the French business district, the Paris business district. A little bit like the city in London, but also like our, like in London, when they built um, out in the East End, they had another big rebuilding project and moved lots of the financial institutions out along the Thames there, out towards the east. Even though it's west of Paris, it's a bit like us moving things east out of London, because it's moving them further down the, not quite the estuary, but moving them downstream the River Seine and moving them out of Paris towards the coast. Big business district in an old area that was called Puteaux. They built the um, lots of skyscrapers. And we'll see why they have become a symbol for the, the glorious years, but then also the oil crisis as we get on. Um, one professor, Christine Ross, an American professor who studied this period in great depth, she calls it the period of fast cars and clean bodies. It was when car manufacturing um, brought a kind of new mobility to French people. It also introduced factory work into Paris with the Renault and Citroën factories and again that's the novel I've just been reading about a young woman who goes to work on the assembly lines in the Renault car factory. Really interesting time for mass production, lots of labour that paid quite well in the cities and drew people in from the countryside. Um, lots of homes at that period didn't have bathrooms, they may have been sharing an outside loo between a family of say about between about eight or ten families in the 1940s and 50s but as the 60s and 70s came people started to have um, bidets and bathrooms and showers in their homes so that's why Professor Ross calls it a time of fast cars and clean bodies people could actually wash at the end of the day if they weren't too tired and often as late as the 70s people would work such long days 12 to 14 hour days um, six or seven days a week that they were too tired to bath or shower in the evening and would just fall asleep. Ross explains, and here's how I like to see references, and as you know by third year, finally year, the, the references win marks, and an inline reference looks like this, where you pop it in parentheses in ordinary curved brackets, you put the year of the publication of the book, the copy that you're using at least, and a comma and if you actually quote from her, and I should have some single inverted commas here to show I've quoted, then the page number from which you've quoted or I've quoted. In that time, France becomes industrialised, so it starts to manufacture rather than just produce agricultural products. It becomes decolonised. It, um, it stops being France across the Mediterranean in Algeria which is a big part of France. So it decolonizes itself and it is de and the, its colonies are decolonized and it becomes more urban. At the beginning of this period, more people lived in the country than were town dwellers. And by the end of it, there was more city, city dwellers than country people. This is interesting for your, in your lives because this is now happening in Iran and Iraq. Not, Syria stalled, as you know, at the moment. Libya did stall, but that's back on again. And more people are moving to work in the big cities in Libya, in Tunisia and China. So France's 30 glorious years are a really good example to study because they've been analysed and you can analyse them and understand them and apply them to the cities that you might go and work in or the countries that you might go and work in if you're working in tourism or business in China or Tunisia, Iran or Iraq or Libya, as Libya emerges again from its uh, uh, conflict. So France was soon on its, on its feet with its output up to pre-war levels by 1947. 
And again, this is quite relevant to us as we hopefully emerge from COVID in a little while. Uh, we want to try and get back onto our feet with industrial output up again and, and consumerism, which consumerism plays a much bigger part in um, keeping economies going in capitalism, capitalist countries, as we know now. So we're hoping that consumerism picks up again so we can start to enjoy the lifestyles that we've had before and you guys can start to build careers as you leave university next spring and summer. And the way that France achieved it was an active role of the state in industry with nationalisation of public utilities. And we've seen even a conservative government in this country through COVID, not exactly nationalising public utilities, but beginning to use your taxes and my taxes to pay to companies to help to support them. So it's a type of um, contingent nationalisation is taking place at the moment. The Chancellor and the uh, Prime Minister are spending about 33 billion of mine and your money that we pay in taxes into helping companies stay afloat during a crisis. And the French did it by nationalisation. They bought in uh, the carbon producing, uh, the coal mining industry, which we did in Britain with the national uh, nationalisation of the coal industry in Britain after the Second World War, so in the 1940s and early 1950s. The French nationalised their electricity production. In my lifetime, we went from a nationalised electricity company in Britain and broke it up into separate privatised industries. The French haven't gone that far and they've still got a company called Electricité de France. And you'll, if you anywhere's, you might be buying electricity from them from for your flat or where you're living now because they've got a branch in Exeter selling electricity that's produced by uh, nuclear power or by coal or green energy in electric in France at the moment. Their gas industry was nationalised, Gaz de France, and you can still see it on um, uh, advertising in France. One more, more interesting for us tourism people um, is Air France was nationalised and in Britain we nationalised our airline and then broke it up again into a privatised separate British Airways um, quite a long time ago in the 1980s um, we broke up into, into privatised industries but Air France has stayed nationalised through the big crisis of 2008 uh, because the government was still supporting it then in European terms, it's still it's a bit naughty to be nationalised. The, the European Union says that we're meant to be living in a market economy um, and it's meant to be a neoliberal economy where the market decides which companies survive or not. So airlines are not allowed to be nationalised. So there's a little bit of conflict there. The banking industry uh, was nationalised in France and the car factories, in particular the Renault car factory, um, so that they could produce cars in a nationalised way, which seems a surprise to, to British people, because I can't properly remember about a British car industry uh, manufacturer being nationalised, even though they've had names like British Leyland. I've always thought of it being a private industry in Britain. One big influx of capital into Europe, and Britain was included in this um, loan system, was the Marshall Aid Plan. And if you think in of essay topics, this is quite a good essay topic to work on the Marshall Aid. Because at first, at first look, it looks like the United States of America are coming to aid and help the war-torn uh, Western European or European countries by uh, flooding uh, capital into those countries that were trying to get back on their feet commercially and industrially again. What in actual fact was, it was a plan by the US government to lend money into the European countries that had no capital uh, left so that they would buy goods uh, from America to give the American, the US suppliers, a foothold in the exports in export industry into Europe. 
and these were these huge sums of money 3.5 billion i know we've just we've just used 33 billion pounds worth of taxpayers money to try and generate regenerate one economy but 3.5 billion was a lot of money back then in the 1940s Prob probably a lot more than the 33 billion that we've spent just um, and they were also part of the deal was that you if you took the money and here's a really good old map that, that shows it really well if it's a bit if it's not very clear on on the uh, zoom then this powerpoint is available for you to download and have a look at more clearly i just really like this graph i don't i don't often use other people's graphs but they do it really well it shows the countries that promise not to become um, socialist countries and join with the with the old russian soviet union and ones that would stay western and you can see they're the ones that received the loan from the united states government so uh, the UK, united kingdom and ireland portugal but not spain france belgium netherlands west germany but not east germany because that was still the wall was still just about to go up and did go up the the uh, berlin wall that separated east germany and west germany Italy did, Austria received money, parts of what's, uh, what was the former Yugoslavia, which is now gone and broken up, um, and down in Greece and Turkey as well. Turkey still hovering about whether to join the European Union or just stay like Britain outside the EU. But you can see the countries that we started to later call the Eastern Bloc, Poland, the uh, Czechoslovakia, before it formed into the Czech Republic and the Slovak uh, separate countries, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, they all stayed outside the Marshall Aid Plan and eventually looked to the Soviet Union to, for support to regenerate their industries. So if you did a project on that, you've got the economics, the regeneration and the factories being built and the work for people, the labour and the careers for people, uh, but also the politics of how Europe thought it had recovered from a Second World War, but was becoming a separated theatre of war for the Cold War, the war that was threatened between communism and capitalism and the use of nuclear weapons to fight that war, which my generation, people of my age, we grew up with. And when I was your age, we'd go on walks and marches to say uh, ban nuclear weapons because we didn't want, we could see where the war was going to be fought here, and we didn't want it to be fought with nuclear weapons in Western Europe. On to happier things, uh, new patterns of consumption and leisure. In France in particular, because our, our main topic in LCS 300 is uh, France and Fran French um, culture, or Spain and Spanish culture. And in France, we saw full employment, we saw a 6% uh, rise in wages and increasing holidays. So this idea that you could have a, being able to be allowed to take a holiday and not get into trouble and not lose your job to someone who was waiting to take your job if you went on holiday, uh, suddenly meant that people could start to go away on holiday and tourism really came to that new group, the working classes, and tourism became a mass product or service something that we could get involved in so we could start teaching it in universities and people could safely go away on holiday and it was such an interesting and uh, novel idea to be able to safely go on holiday for a week or two that it was made here there was a famous comedy filmmaker Jacques Tati who made uh, a, series, a film called Les Vacances de Monsieur Hulot The Holidays of Mr Hulot and he's from a, a sort of quite well off working class or lower middle class background and he doesn't know how to go on holiday so the joke all the time right through the film is him trying to understand what you do on holiday because it was such a new concept is do you sit on a deck chair do you go for meals do you talk to other people so we didn't know how to go on holiday at that time but we've learned by now we've had 50 or 60 years of learning how to be on holiday and that came out in February 53 
and you can probably get copies of that through Amazon or there'll be quite big chunks of it that you can find for free on YouTube and watch scenes from that to get the idea. We call that period the new affluence. And out of the new affluence came the consumer society. And that's the way that our capitalism operates today, is that people make things but that doesn't cost the company very much to make. They sell them for a lot of money and then we buy them and that keeps the economy going. So a thing like your iPhone doesn't cost that very much, very much to make in China. The, it's sold for quite a lot, £600, £800, um, and then uh, quite a lot of people make that profit and that keeps the economy going. The products that were called like, we often used to refer to them as white goods, like washing machines and fridges, they began to be manufactured and by the end of the 1950s, from almost zero on all of those, then 7.5% 7, 7 of French families owned a fridge, 10% owned a washing machine, 26% of television, I don't properly remember televisions arriving, they, they, they were around just a little bit before me, but I do remember colour televisions and landing on the moon, but 26% of televisions, uh, people owned televisions, or families, sorry, families, and 21% owned a car, which was really huge. And that's quite unusual because I, I would imagine that mon not many of you, as you've started your new family of living at university, that you, that you don't own a car yet in your new family. And car ownership has changed over that period. But looking at it in detail, and this might be a project that you pick to do, the Renault 4 CV, and that's what cars looked like, just about recognisable um, in 1947. Just in Paris alone in 1960, there were a million cars, but within five years, they doubled to two million cars. And I've got that reference from the Ross book called Fast Cars and Clean Bodies, the red one. We've got copies of that in the library, and you can often buy secondhand copies on Amazon if you don't fancy going to the library, if you feel like it's still a bit scary. What it meant for Paris is it just got really packed. You, know, you used to be able to drive into Paris and park anywhere, sometimes double parking, um, and then go to the cafe or go to a restaurant or leave your car parked outside the hotel overnight. But within by 65, that was beginning to be impossible. And then the Perry Freak was built that's a little bit like the M25 is, not quite, it's a, perhaps a bit more like the North, North Circular and South Circular around London, for people who know London. The Perry Freak was built and they started that in 1957. And that was a way of keeping the traffic circulating around Paris so that people didn't take the quick route across town and crossing, that's the River Seine in the middle there, crossing the River Seine. So it kept people going around if they didn't want to access the city itself. And the big airports were built out of town, like uh, Roissy Charles de Gaulle Airport, the, the one that we fly to for holidays in Paris, and the one down at the bottom here, Orly Airport. So cities began to get so big that they were, they were too successful, and we had to start thinking of ways of spreading them out a little bit more, become greater areas. Those fast cars too were pretty dangerous. We hadn't quite un understood braking systems. We hadn't got modern technology for slowing them down fast enough. Tires um, using rubber from French colonies in the tropics were, we hadn't got the grip system sorted out very well and they would aquaplane and skid. And so lots of people were killed in car crashes. A famous one for this period, the uh, a famous writer who I like his writing, Albert Camus, who had won the Nobel Prize. With his prize money, he bought a fast car and a nice villa down in the south of France. And then driving back home to Paris with his publisher, he was killed in, in, his, in a car crash. So it was uh, these fast cars, although they were exciting, they were dangerous things too. 
my first car was about the 1970s and I remember skidding off the road because the braking system were terrible. They were rear-wheel drive, which made cars skid, not front-wheel drive, and tyres were terrible in those days. They were also called the Les Années de Béton, the concrete years. And between 1946 and 1985, this population of the whole of France grew from 40 and a bit million to 55 million people. France has now got a bigger population than Britain, just more recently. 69% of those were now living in towns or cities, compared with the rural peasantry, 54% before the war. And again, I've used my long strip of photograph along the bottom that I took from the Tour Montparnasse, and you can see the edge of Paris, that thin green belt, now uh, the Bois de Boulogne, now being taken over by new um, suburbs being built outside that and outside and beyond the Perifrique. The Perifrique runs pretty well through that green belt that you can see that's that thin green stripe along the middle of my photograph down the bottom there. And what did people live in when they came into the city? Here's a little mock-up from the, one of the ideal home exhibitions in Paris in their bigger insert photograph and they had tiny little fridges a little hand basin to wash wash up in, uh, units that could be pushed away under the workbenches, and then across the centre of the, the middle of the, the little orange and, and cream coloured photograph is a curtain, a plastic curtain, and when you finish the cooking you could pull that across and then you sat in this part. So they were like super bed sits in a way, where people were crammed into little boxes of concrete. There was a new unit of transportation as well, a couple. So people tended to start to live in couples. They would get married much earlier. They would get married full stop. Before that, people didn't often get married in the same way that nowadays, the last say 10 or 15 years, marriage has gone out of fashion again, is that there was a consumption group called the couple. And France withdrew into a private space. So rather than being like a Mediterranean country like Italy or Portugal or Spain, where people went out in the early evenings and uh, mixed a lot, they retreated into a private space. And in a themed essay kind of a way, they reduced into the hexagon away from the colonies. France used to be Algeria as well on the map in the bottom of the slide there and it squows back into its hexagon, just the mainland France. They retreated into the home, those little boxes. They retreated into working and living in couples rather than working individually or in big groups, and living in big groups. They retreated into the kitchen rather than going to restaurants and canteens for meals. And they retreated into those tiny little cars. So they were squashed up together in little cars sitting next to each other. There's a real construction, a consumption and contraction of space. 400,000 new living spaces were being built in uh, skyscrapers. These are ones from down in um, Nice. They call them les grandes ensembles, which contradicts my theory in the previous slide. Ensemble means together, but the togetherness was the fact that the skyscrapers, skyscrapers were built on uh, virgin land, green spaces together, and the blocks were together. But the actual individual living spaces were quite segregated and isolated, a little bit like living in student halls, but without the communal kitchens. So a huge change in the way that people lived. Not a shock to us today because we've lived like that for 20, 25 years, but then a big difference. People were, there was the rural exodus, people were moving out of the countryside, and there's my famous little cartoon picture again, trying to pull their roots up from the soil. I used to joke that when I first went to university, you can take the country, you could take Charlie out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Charlie. So they, even though you were in the town, in the university, you still wore your berry and carried all your belongings in a knotted handkerchief on a stick. 
what did that that royal rural exodus people didn't want to live in the cold unheated farmhouses anymore and they lived to, they wanted to go and work in factories and they did that because of the railways that were being built and then they could move fast they enforced primary education meaning that everybody could read and read the same language and that language was french rather than breton so they began to only speak one language or at least have access to one language through primary through enforced primary education and then really strange thing that people didn't know was having an effect but researchers have found that and that was military service and that was where young men in particular were sent on military service to another town and they lived in big communal uh, barracks other men built up knowledge of another town built up friendship groups so that when they went back home they kept those friendship networks and meant that if there was some work in Bordeaux or some work up in Lille building a new railway they kept in touch and gave each other jobs and were able to be more mobile because they had a kind of internet of friendship groups. It was the baby boomers being invented just a little bit before my time perhaps about 10 years before me for so I'm just outside the baby boomers and the next generation the Génération Galère but the baby boomers came about when uh, President de Gaulle in France said that he wanted to see in the next 10 years 12 million bouncing babies for France and the public were taxed for this whether you had a family or not you paid taxes to pay family allowance to pay tax relief for people who had big families to pay housing allowances for people who had families to pay for cheaper transport and to pay for cinema tickets for couples who had children as for a couple who has children so you could have cheaper cinema tickets the, he didn't uh, foresee when he introduced this boom of babies that was successful that um, um but by our our generation we were still paying for them but we're now paying for their pensions rather than paying for their um, family allowance so there's a little bit of a mismatch by increasing the population so rapidly then china were much more um, measured in their approaches to repopulating the country there were people left behind so we've gone from bad to good and then a little bit of a bad note again pay for management went up huge 40 percent skilled workers went up huge so the people who could do uh, who could fit the um, sun visors and the windows and the door handles to those citrons and renos their wages went up but the minimum wage so the menial jobs and the very low service industry jobs only crept up a little bit and Christine Ross, Christine Ross, the uh, the red book that you ought to read for this module, talks of a new group called the Middle Manager in British English, but in French it's called Le Cadre, Le Cadre, and she continues to use that term. And if you're writing an essay for me or for Danielle or for the external examiner, who's a French studies lecturer as well. It's quite fine to use that word, le cadre, to talk about this new class of middle manager. And there's a reference to it in Ross, in that page 166, 68. It was also a time of a new theory being spotted by Pierre Bourdieu. If you're a tourism student, one of my tourism or tourism hospitality students, you should know Bourdieu by now for your on other projects, for your honours project. He's really important in tourism studies. He's the chap who understood about the reproduction of personal cultural capital and how social inequality is reproduced. We think we're keeping making it a level playing field for everyone, but inadvertently we ask for people to have cultural capital. And in universities where we try and decolonize and make a level playing field, we keep reinventing this cultural capital. And cultural capital is stored up in people, in younger graduates like you, 
and it's used to gain better management jobs. So if you go out with a degree, you have more chance of getting a better management job. It's almost why we do it, it's why you've chosen to do it. So cultural capital is a difficult one for a government trying to uh, manage and give fairness to everyone in a society. And every now and then a government will announce a new scheme to try and help working class people or people who didn't go to university um, try and find ways for them to catch up and usually don't do very well at it. And I think uh, Boris Johnson's just announced another one for Britain. We see this in a, in a more dramatic way in the North African countries and in the Middle East at the moment, um, where the governments haven't got enough money to help the people who've been left behind by cultural capital. So it's great theorist to read some Bourdieu, both for this module and also for any of your tourism modules. Journal articles, I think I'll come back to this um, about where the journal articles are and I'll just scoot on a little bit. Oh, that's it. Good, we are at the end. Let's come out of the stop and stop share a moment. Good, good, good. How are we doing time-wise? About 40, 45 minutes. Um, how many people are still uh, are with us? Good, a good number. You're doing good. Great. Well done. Thanks for bearing with us on that. I think what I'll do, oh, I've got some messages as well. If you're going to be doing it on Spanish, do I need to know in this lecture? It's always good to stay but she hasn't. Oh well. If you've already chosen between Spanish and French, then mm -mm, I suppose not. I'm, I obviously think it's great. I love um, French culture and I think you can get a lot from it and connect it across between the two. But hey ho. Um, if you're sure you want to do Spanish, then you can leave. That'd be good if you aren't sure. Hey good, thanks Anne who uh, st sticking up for me there, good response, thank you. It, that about sums it up really well, that your, your response, Anne. That, that gets it across better than me, thanks, thank you. What I wanted to do is, perhaps I won't have a breather, because I I, you seem to be bearing up quite well, is I just wanted to dip into a few resources so that you feel like you can find them and um, find your way around. First of all, there's my lectures, that fit this period really well and they're all in text format and there yes I'm, I'm recording this too it's still and it's showing it's recording safely and it takes about an hour to process it on panopto and then i'll attach the recording to the bottom of the dle but i just wanted to show you these two places so there's um Perhaps the, the first one is where the word version of my lectures are, are recorded. And these are in ESO GMC. Wait a second, I'll paste the URL into the chat line. That URL there, eServe.org.uk, a little in a subdirectory within that TMC. That's where the text version of everything I've talked about today is stored, and I've set it up in a way um, so that you can use a, a, a search engine within there, and you can search for themes. So if you if you're looking at say the role of women in there, which is always a really good essay title to follow through on and how their lives changed in that 30 year period is you could, you could just search for women or women's role and it will find you all the lectures that mention that. And I've made them permanent and I've given them authors, either myself or Tony McNeil, and you can cite from them too. And at the bottom of each lecture, there's a bar that you can clip and you can use that for pasting in as the reference too. And they're acceptable references. In, in, they're almost as good as a journal article. I do want you to dip into journal articles too and there's two places to look for journal articles. One is the usual place, Primo, and I'm sure you know where Primo is now. Just a reminder when you use Primo, do log in, log in and log in again to Primo, otherwise you've done all your work, you've done all your searching, 
and you find your way down to the journal article and then it won't let you in because you're not logged in and so it's really frustrating so if you say right i'm going to do half an hour or three quarters of an hour of journal searching in primo log in just as before you start so that website um King, that website is where all of the talk for my lectures is written down as text in a citable way and you can search through it there's a little search engine on there so french in Con uh, france in contemporary times the les trente glorieuses the 30 glorious years the marshall plan the role of women and you can search for them great sorry i'm answering the, the chat down there as well so the first place to look is primo as well or second place to look is primo but then there's there's a place where the french have put all of their journals and a lot of french journals are now translated into english and they're all at a site called um it's called reviews.org let me try and find it and paste it in onto chat as well review spelt in french is the french word for a journal article I'm just about to try and paste in the most up-to-date url for that you can find it with reviews Org, but they're moving them all now to an English spelling of journals because when because the French word review for a journal people think it means a review or a, and going to a nightclub and watching um, a dance whilst eating dinner so they're starting to use the English word for it journals open edition and I've put links to that on the Moodle um, if you it, have a few minutes look for it if you can't then panic gently and email me and i'll send it to you again and write a few notes about it again over the last couple of years really and over last summer in fact this summer sorry they've, they've become a lot better at giving you material that at least has got an english abstract and if it looks like an interesting article you can get a google translate of it and get good material out of it and remember it's journal articles that win marks not websites and not um, um, newspaper articles unless you're doing some, some, something specific where the newspaper articles where you're treating the newspaper articles as data that you're analyzing in a formal way the final place of really good places to find things is the ONS and the ONND. Oh, and the ONS. I don't mean that. I mean the French one. Ah, oh, it's gone. There. very french specific site but um chat to everyone generally chat that's the one i wanted to show the oec oecd the Economic and, and Development Council, they're based in Paris, but they give really good figures on development in France and Britain. So if you're doing any, any comparative work, you can find some really good statistics and graphs from that. So another really good source for it. I think we'll leave it there. We've done a good, good piece of work. Just do a pause on the recording.